is up to them. Each year, up to 800 graduates join Matsushita, and for the past two years, they've been given a choice of contracts. Management said this would encourage a different sort of recruit. Unless we changed our traditional methods of employment, talented and ambitious young people, many with specialist skills, wouldn't have come to our company. That was the consensus among all the directors. We believe that the company must cater for these talents, that it has to be a place where they can fulfill themselves. That's why we are encouraging this new contract system. When Miho Sasaki gave the formal speech on the recruit's behalf, the first woman to do so, she seemed to be endorsing a very long-term approach. Matsushita Kohonosuke Sogyosha wa Shouwa 7 nen ni 250 nen keikak toyu su seiki ni oyobu keikak o tateta to kiite olimasu. Watashi tachi mo 21 seiki dake de naku 22 seiki so shite 23 seiki ni tsunagaru scale no ooki hatsume hatken sozo o kono de de nashi togeru koto o chikai but Ms. Sasaki's apparent orthodoxy didn't stop her from taking one of the new short-term contracts herself. I wasn't thinking of leaving Matsushita when I made my decision. My reason for choosing the new contract was that I wanted to use the extra pay to improve my skills. The best time to make this investment is when you're young. <laughs> I'll be spending the extra money on language tuition so that I could become an interpreter later. This means I could leave the company if I want to. I've no idea if I will, but I'm increasing my options. Over the past two years, more than 40% of graduate recruits, all of whom have to do time on the assembly line, have taken the new contract. Traditionalists fear the new system will undermine the legendary commitment and loyalty. Under the old lifetime employment system, people are loyal to the company even after they have lost interest in their actual work. But we don't want that sort of half-hearted loyalty anymore. We now hope employees will be able to align their personal aims with the company's and that they'll stick with us because we share a common interest. We need to establish a more active and conscious loyalty amongst our staff. As companies struggle to cope with the downturn of the 1990s, reformers questioned another once admired feature of Japanese management. The way decisions were reached by consensus. It was meant to work like this. A lower level employee circulates a formal memo to his superiors, suggesting some change or new idea. As the memo moves its way through the company, peers and superiors either sign or append suggestions. Through this consensus decision-making approach, a new idea is either implemented or discarded. From a Western perspective, the ringy system of decision by group consensus seems time-consuming and unwieldy. But the power of the ringy system lies in the joint responsibility all signers share for the successful implementation of the new idea. Consensus decision-making works in a way that if you're confronted with a problem uh, as a company, you go down to the people who are really involved with the problem or are coping with the problem 
uh, get them to come up with a recommendation as to what to do. And then what the top says is, all right, you go ahead and do it that way. Therefore, it is very difficult to introduce, let's say, radical changes. It can change, introduce slight changes, but very difficult to introduce, let's say, revolutionary changes. There are six experts working in this company. How do you find this? Professor Ishikura, who gives English language business courses, believes consensus decision-making, far from being a virtue, represents a Japanese weakness. When you have other people who have formed the traditional core competence of our company, what would you do with these people? Decision-making is very difficult in Japan, partly because we have always been taught there is always the right solution, right answer to the question. And we have been taught in grade school and primary school that there is the answer to the question, to any one of the questions. And so if you challenge that, you get uh, ostracized or whatever, and you're not supposed to challenge this big authority or right solution, right answer to the problem. Actually, How do you uh, respond to that? But uh, in my own opinion, so... Yeah. Okay, so... <clears throat> Uh, Would you the, like to? But, uh, well, yeah. But uh, my my own opinion is the uh, yeah. uh, same as his. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can argue, but. Uh, so so she tries to get students to adopt a more assertive Western style of decision making. Asaki-san, what is the profitability in your business? Uh, That's my, my industry. percent. I think it's it's a matter of the, if you get a right product and if you get it right in at the, in, at the right moment okay. so if you were top, if you were no matter what you have to make a decision you have to tell me what do you think is the industry attractive what are you going to do if you're top management and you can't just say i don't have enough information or i don't know i'm not a top management that's your job and you need to practice it and uh, so that the uh, marketing manager is uh, just in the trouble so we we don't have time to have a, a kind of a power game in the company we have to decide which direction we should go <laughs> When he took over as president of Toshiba, Mr. Nishimura wanted to behave like an American chief executive and take rapid decisions on his own. He slimmed the company's headquarters and then reformed the board of directors itself. Board of directors, the number used to be 34. And uh, the board meeting was very, very dull with uh, 34 members. Uh, there's no, no dialogue or no, no discussion practically. I felt that uh, it is not proper and we have to energize the board of directors meeting with the spirit of in-depth review and discussions. The simplest way is to reduce the number. And uh, reduce the number. We, last year, we reduced the number from 34 down to 12. The greatest jolt to Japanese management pride came at Hiroshima, where Mazda was losing a million dollars a day by the mid 90s. Mazda wa, kyonen ni shigatsu, shoungekiteki na hatpyou wo okonai mashita. Amerika no jidousha meka. A new team of managers arrived at Mazda, which then employed 26,000 workers. I think that there was abject horror, locally and nationally, that uh, a Westerner uh, was coming into the company uh, as president of a Japanese company. I think that they, they were horrified for the most part. I think that was one of the biggest concerns. The Ford team, uh, as it was identified, was going to come in and slash and burn. To the relief of Mazda's house union, they managed to reduce the numbers through early retirement and a halt in recruitment, the usual corporate way. But there was a temporary pay cut. The hardships we've suffered were not caused by Ford, but by the previous Japanese management, which had been lax in restructuring our company. In fact, we had to make some sacrifices, or we would not have survived. 
We just had to go through with them. Japanese management wasn't getting results. <laughs> and they knew it. To get itself back to par, a floundering oil company brought in an experienced American manager, Donald Romano. この to stop the losses at Koa, Romano wanted a complete overhaul, but he found the company's culture stood in his way. There seems to be, and I've heard it a lot, yes, but, and you see it every day. Yes, we can do that, but. There's a, a rule or a regulation or a law or a process or a problem that uh, causes us difficulty to do that. So if you keep uh, trying, keep trying, well then you can finally break through and get things done. But there's this immediate wall of resistance. To help him demolish the wall of resistance, Romano called in the consultants. <laughs> Their scheme to reorganize the company would reduce the layers of management from 11 to 5. Romano wanted a more informal atmosphere and made Friday a dress down day. And he took on another central feature of Japanese management pay by seniority. He told younger staff why the change was needed. This is difficult for us because how do young people get ahead? How do they really make an input to the company? There's nothing for them to gain. Our pay structure will be changed. Our uh, merit increases, our bonuses, uh, they will be based on how well the company does and how much we contribute to the company. So it will, it will not matter if you're 50 years old or you're 30 years old uh, that's not going to be important. What's going to be important is how you perform in the company. The traditional respect for age was also challenged at Mazda. In the past, managers hadn't been made directors till they reached their late 50s. But President Miller started to promote much younger men. In the design department, he visited his latest nominee to the board, who is a mere 41. I think that he is probably the youngest Japanese director of a major or of a listed company other than a family member in a family business. Already, the feedback that's come to me from the employees has been very positive. They're shocked because it's extraordinarily radical to have someone that age uh, as a director of the company. But he happens to be a superbly talented young man that can make a significant contribution to the company for many years. We used uh, this uh, approach, mm -hmm. and uh, finally, my English isn't so good, and I could understand only half of what Mr. Miller said when he appointed me. But to be serious, the fact was that my youth was one of the reasons why I was chosen. We need a different approach to quality improvement. Youth is necessary to get that new approach. That's what Mr. Miller said to me. 
pay and promotion by merit were resented by many older managers. I have seen a situation in which with certain companies, people in their 40s, uh, 